This is monster. This is not human. Tonight on 48 Hours. He took my child's life. And I can hear all of them. Help me. Outrage in Texas. The murder is just a way of covering up the crime. First time I heard the name Kenneth MacDuff was in 1966. Sentenced to die. He strangled her with a broomstick across her throat. Can you imagine it? He walked out on parole. There will probably be bodies start turning up very shortly. I believe that was the right decision. Amazing that he could get out to do it again. Who knows how many corpses may be buried along the highways. Did they die because he got out? And she was washing her car, grabbed by two men. He had his girl by the throat. He says it was a setup. In her plea of not guilty. Nobody should be put through that type of torture. He's trying to save himself. They say he was free to kill. She hurts baby, so I want him to hurt. It's too many people against me. Has your jury arrived at the verdict, sir? Yes. His name is Kenneth Allen McDuff. He has been described as one of the most violent criminals in Texas, perhaps in the nation. But as you will see, the dimensions of his story may be even more horrifying. Tonight, in an exclusive interview, you will meet a man who has been called a monster as we bring you the chronicle of what some say was one man's slide into a life of violence and murder. Recently, his story unfolded in a dramatic trial, one that raised troubling questions about justice in the Lone Star State. But Macduff's story really begins with his first run-in with the law nearly 30 years ago on the dusty streets of a small Texas town. This was an innocent town. But big news in a little town was this. Football. There's Kenneth Macduff right there. He was kind of a loner, stayed to himself a lot. Kenneth McDuff grew up in this small town, Rosebud, Texas. Population, one too many, some say, if you count Kenneth McDuff. We've had maybe two or three men around here to be sent to prison. One for stealing two turkeys, mm -hmm. and then Kenneth McDuff for murder. Murder? Kenneth McDuff was 20 years old that summer of 1966, and already he was a convicted felon, a burglar who was out on parole. He told a friend he was going out to look for a girl, and he found one by this high school baseball field. She was 15 years old. She was in a car with her 17-year-old boyfriend and his 16-year-old cousin. At gunpoint, Kenneth McDuff kidnapped them. He drove them out of town, and then he shot the two boys at point-blank range, killing both of them. He raped the 15-year-old girl, and then he killed her too. He strangled her with a broomstick across her throat. Can you imagine anything that horrible? John Kilgore has been editor of the Rosebud newspaper for 35 years. He shot these two boys in the trunk of that car. But this is monster. This is not human. That's Robert. He was just a very good boy. There wasn't a mean streak in him. Robert was Jack and Louise Brand's only son. This is Edna Louise Sullivan when she was 15. This is Marcus Dunn, his cousin, that was made when he was 15. And then one night, they were all murdered. It's real tough. Did you go to the trial? Oh, yes. Did you ever make eye contact with McDuff? Oh, yes. It was horrible because he didn't even have, I mean, just like well, it was he, all a joke to him. They asked him, why did he do such a thing? And he said, well, for kicks, man. Just for kicks, man. Kenneth Allen McDuff enjoys torturing the human beings much more than the actual murder. The murder is just a way of covering up the crime. As a teenager, yeah, Sheriff Larry Pamplin helped his father arrest Kenneth McDuff for the murders. 
the man is extremely vicious and there's no one safe that comes into contact with him. The man was sentenced to death. Kenneth McDuff was sentenced to die in the electric chair right here at the Texas State Prison. But in 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that death penalty laws, as they were then written, were unconstitutional. So McDuff's sentence was commuted to life in prison. Over and over again, he applied for parole. Once, he even tried to bribe a member of the parole board to let him out. But over and over again, he was turned down. No one back in Rosebud thought he'd ever get out. But in 1989, 23 years after he killed those three teenagers, the unthinkable happened. Kenneth McDuff was granted parole. He was allowed to leave this prison a free man. Well, the system totally broke down. The man should have never, ever been paroled. McDuff was ultimately granted his freedom by two members of the Texas Parole Board. Mr. Granberry. James Granberry, who is under investigation for bribery in another case. No comment. You know, we've got an overburdened system that... And Chris Mealy, who says the board was under tremendous pressure. We were asked to try to release approximately 150 people a day. Mm -hmm. 750 people a week, 3,000 a month, 36... At the time McDuff was paroled, the federal government had ordered the state of Texas to relieve prison overcrowding. McDuff, when I made the decision in September of 89, I believed in my heart that that was the right decision. Obviously now in hindsight, I would uh, make a different decision. Back in Rosebud, people's worst fears came true. McDuff came back to town. And all of a sudden, the streets were empty. No one walked. No one walked. It was as if a cloud lifted over all of a sudden. Being in law enforcement, I was scared to death. I thought a, ma a mass murder was on the loose end. You know, how, how would you feel he come knocking on your door? This town felt as if it was being held captive? Right. Yes. By this guy? I had a gun loaded each door. But, you know, I knew the guy years ago, and I just afraid he did show up. Well, you know, I wanted some protection because I didn't want him in the house. I mean, everybody was scared. My wife wouldn't go anywhere without, without me or a gun, really. And then there was the message left on John Kilgore's answering machine. I erased it because I did not want my wife to hear it. The voice, he says, was Kenneth McDuff's. Well, the main part of it was, I'll get you. There may be just one person in the whole county who does not fear Kenneth McDuff. He just loves children and older people. Really? This one, his mother, Addie. He cut grass for all the old ladies and most, but it, uh, he was hard working, yes. You don't think to this day that Kenneth killed those three no, teenagers? No, I know he didn't. He said he didn't, I know he didn't. Kenneth didn't I do don't, it. I didn't, y'all didn't come here to talk to me. I'm through. But seven months after his release from prison, Kenneth McDuff went after another teenager. When he was in Rosebud one evening, he pulled a knife on a young male threatened his life. And this is when he's out on parole after killing three teenagers? That's correct. So what happened? McDuff was sent back to prison. But believe it or not, just two months later, a bureaucrat on the parole board staff rubber stamped his release again. Is that how the system is supposed to work? No, and I think if you look at any system, your system as far as reporting the news or anything else, there are folks who, for whatever reason, fall through the cracks and yeah, I don't but they, don't, usually, they, they don't usually go out and kill teenagers that goes right back to the parole system it stinks right. he took my child's life he took my sister-in-law's child's life why should he keep his life and why should they turn him out to, to go out here and kill somebody else's first child what did you think would happen after he was set free when i first found out that kenneth mcduff had been freed my words basically work. I don't know if it'll be a week, month, or six months, but there will probably be bodies start turning up very shortly of young women or boys and girls. He has done foul deeds. He has taken lives. 
the man does not need to be in society anymore. person in the state of Texas and beyond. In 1989, the news that Kenneth McDuff was back on the street blew through Texas like a cold wind. We assumed that he would remain in prison the rest of his life. Well, that was a bad assumption. Parnell McNamara and his brother Mike are deputy U.S. Marshals in Waco, Texas. Why does someone get pleasure out of torturing another human being? Why does someone get pleasure out of killing another human being? Animals don't do that. When Kenneth McDuff got out, what did you think at that time? I was very concerned that it would happen again. You certainly hope and pray that it doesn't. But it might have. From what we understand, when she was washing her car, apparently she was grabbed by two men, we assume. The last thing anyone heard of Colleen Reed was the sound of her scream. It echoed through this car wash in Austin, Texas in December of 1991. Witnesses heard her scream and um, found her car with soap suds on it. Lori Bible is Colleen's sister. The money that was in her purse, $19.73. They didn't take that? We didn't take her car, didn't take her wallet, her credit cards, her cash. Just calling, it's the only thing they took. She was, she was 28, God. We're almost done. In February of 1992, two months after Colleen was kidnapped, there were no suspects and no trace of Colleen. And I miss her. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to not cry. It's painful to, to you know, to pick up her clothes and, and look at them. And I almost felt like I, I was betraying her when I went into her apartment and moved her out. Then, on March 1st, 1992, another kidnapping reported. My wife is missing. She's not at the store. Okay, and your wife is missing? Yes. This one in Waco, 100 miles away. What is her name? Melissa Ann Northrup. A young woman named Melissa Northrup is abducted from a convenience store, and McDuff's car is found nearby. Approximately 300 yards north of the quickback store. McDuff's car fits the description of an automobile seen leaving the car wash in Austin as Colleen Reed was kidnapped. I had heard that they had a suspect and that I had better pray that it wasn't who they thought it was, because if it was, she was dead. McDuff had dropped out of sight. The McNamara's joined a massive manhunt to find him. During that, we came across the name of Hank Warley. Hank Worley was described to us as a weak-willed sidekick of Kenneth McDuff. He's a real easy going. one. He's nice to talk to. He's friendly. You'd think he's the world's greatest guy. Until he just falls off the deep end and does weird things. I got word about Hank Worley from the police. And they told me that he had confessed. Your imagination runs wild. But never did I dream. Not my worst nightmare was as bad as what really happened to her. About 9 o'clock on the evening of December 29, 1991, Colleen Reed brought her pride and joy, her brand new car here to wash it. At about the same time, according to Hank Worley, he was riding around town with Kenneth McDuff looking for drugs. They drove by this car wash and spotted Reed. Worley says he and McDuff returned and pulled into the bay next to Colleen. When you come back, you had this girl by the throat and lift her. She was hollering, please, not me, stop. And don't let this happen to me. 
And what was he saying at the time? He, he wasn't saying nothing. He just told me to get in the back where backer and hold her. And then we drove off and then got about two or three miles down the road. And he, he swapped driver and he got back there with her and I made, made me drive the car. And when he started sexually assaulting her then. Worley says the assault went on for more than half an hour as he drove north of Austin. Then he and McDuff changed places. No, I, I didn't want sex with her, but if I didn't have sex with her, he's going to get back over there and beat her up some more and burn her with cigarettes. Burn her with cigarettes? Yes, sir. He's taking cigarettes and getting the fire real hot and burning her down in the, in the wrong spot. According to Worley, they traveled to this abandoned road near Temple. With her hands tied, Colleen was dragged out of the car, and the torture continued. He turned around and he hit her, slapped her real hard, and knocked her backwards. And then he took another cigarette and he lit it and got the fire real hot and burned her again like that again. And he puts her in the car and the trunk of the car. In the trunk? He, he puts her in the trunk? Yes, sir. Puts her in the trunk of the car, closes the trunk down. He takes me home. On the way home, he asked me for, for my pocket knife. I told him, I don't know where it is. And he asked me, well, I need a shovel. He said, like, let me borrow a shovel. I said, I ain't got one. A pocket knife and a shovel. Yes, sir. Did he say what he wanted to do with that? No, sir, he didn't say what he was going to do with it, but I knew what he was going to do with it. He wanted to kill him with it. Why didn't you do something? That's yeah. the question that, you know, people want to know the answer to. Yeah, there ain't a lot you could do. It's real scary to be there like that. You, you, can't, you can't help them, you can't help yourself, you know? If you can't help yourself, then you ain't no way you can help anybody else. I didn't. I wasn't even sure if I was gonna make it out of there that night. I always have a tear for that girl. I'll, I'll always cry for her for what she went through. Nobody should be put through that type of torture. He's self-serving. He's a worthless human being. He could have stopped the car, taken the keys out, and walked away. And Colleen may still be alive today if he would have had the courage to stand up and do that. Hank Worley brought us to this road and told us that this is the location where he and Kenneth McDuff brought Colleen Reed. At the time, we thought we might be able to find her body here. But uh, we never have found it. But lawmen do find McDuff. Authorities were tipped that he'd been living in Kansas City under an assumed name. McDuff is brought back to Texas and put behind bars. But by this time, half a dozen women are missing or dead. No. And McDuff is the prime suspect. Mike and Kill. Is that true? No. Thank God for Mike and Parnell McNamara. We never would have known what had happened to Colleen if they wouldn't have been so diligent in their investigations. Building a case against McDuff for the murder of Colleen Reed is slow going because her body has never been found. So McDuff will first stand trial for the kidnapping and killing of Melissa Northland. Colleen Reed! Melissa Northland, you bastard bitches! It's mine! Save the Lord! He's gonna get you! Next, the trial of Kenneth McDuff. Jump up all your teeth. It's country. Live your walk, Mom. Live your walk. It's peaceful. <laughs> you never dream of it happening to you. And that's why people need to open up their eyes, because it can't happen to you. It happened to Brenda Solomon's daughter, I know. Melissa Northrop. It was a year ago that she was abducted from the roadside convenience store where she worked. Say hi. She left behind two young children. At one point, Amber asked me one night when we were putting her to bed. She said, um, Mimi, is mommy dead? And I said, Amber, I don't know. 
and we're going to pray that God brings m Mommy home. So every night we prayed that God would bring Mommy home, and He did. He just didn't bring her home the way we wanted her. Prosecutors believe only two people know what really happened that night, and one of them, Melissa Northrup, is buried here along the interstate, one exit down from where she was abducted. Here we go. Behind you, behind you. The other person who knows, according to the prosecution, is Kenneth Allen McDuff, charged with kidnapping and killing Melissa Northrup. Did you kill Melissa Northrup? No. No? no. Kenneth, do you want to take the stand in your own McDuff has become so notorious that the trial had to be moved from Waco, Texas, where Melissa was kidnapped, to Houston. Oh, big building, ain't they? District Attorney John Segrist heads the prosecution team. The evidence is strong, it's credible, it's believable, it points directly to Kenneth McDuff and no one else. Ernie, how are you this morning? Remember, this is not the first time that Texas prosecutors are arguing that McDuff should be put to death. I mean, you see any irony in you coming back again, I, I trying to put like, this guy in the death chamber again? Like Daddy says, you don't, try not to lick the calf over again. Now, Kenneth McDuff has become a symbol of everything that's wrong with criminal justice in Texas. You know, there are several people that would be alive today if McDuff had been executed or at least been kept in prison for life as he deserved. Who knows how many corpses may be buried along the highways that he may have been involved in. He is not a saint. He's not pure as the driven snow, as they would say. But did he kill he, Melissa Northrup? My view, no. Mike Charlton is one of three attorneys assigned by the state to develop McDuff's defense. I tell you, we've got some pretty strong religious people on our jury panel. So what religious argument can you make? Jesus Christ before Pontius Pilate, not doing the right thing and giving in to mob psychology. Kenneth McDuff was literally at the wrong place at the wrong time, at the wrong moment in history. He has become the spark, the catalyst, the focus of all of these people's fears and hatreds about the criminal justice system in Texas. I expect it to be right with contradiction. I expect it to be a shock to anybody who listens. You can't control the attention that this case has generated. You cannot control public opinion. He should have been dead a long time ago. The next couple of weeks are just likely to be hell. <laughs> Melissa's stepfather and brother will follow the entire trial. The victim has no rights. He's got all the rights. He's got the court trial. He's got attorneys. Melissa don't have nothing. And I think it's time to take his rights away. To which indictment, sir? How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Your Honor, to please the court, my client would like to enter a plea of not guilty. Does the state care to make an opening statement? We do, Your Honor. If you would proceed, sir. Kenneth Allen McDuff. The evidence will show that he told people that he was going to kill and rob somebody that night. 911. Yeah, this is Aaron Northup. I need, I need a um, sheriff's GPS officer over here immediately. What's wrong? My wife is missing. She's not at the store. Your wife is missing? Early Sunday morning, about 4.45, we received a 911 call from Melissa Northrop's husband. The lead investigator on the case is Detective Richard Strout. His wife was working the 11 to 7 shift at Quick Pack store and uh, she was missing. How did you find the body finally? A uh, fisherman uh, found uh, Melissa's body in a gravel pit 57 days later. 57 days later? Yes sir. She was in the water approximately 57 days. How did you identify her? Yeah, she was identified through dental charts. The hands of this corpse had been bound behind the back. At one time or another, the ankles had been bound with shoelaces. Did you know at this point that McDuff was involved? No, we did not. When did you uh, start suspecting him? When we uh, found his car abandoned in the parking lot of the New Road Motor Inn, which is approximately 300 yards north of the Quickback store. Can you put him at the scene of the crime at the time the crime was committed? with physical evidence? No. That's a problem. Well, it could be. In fact, the case against Kenneth McDuff is based almost entirely on circumstantial evidence. It can be somewhat complex. This is just as strong a circumstantial evidence murder case as, as I can recall. We have four aces. 
Uh -huh. and, what, are, what are your four aces? Well, uh, we have uh, you know, evidence which places him within two miles of the location of the body. We got him put within 200 yards of the uh, quick pack store at the time that uh, Melissa Northrop was abducted. We've got uh, expert testimony of his hair in uh, her automobile. Uh, we have the fact that he ran off, disappeared, not even telling his mama where he was going. I mean, you call it four aces, the defense would call it a house of cards. And what you will see before you in the next two weeks may well rank as one of the most inept, one of the most bungled, one of the most error-prone criminal investigations in the history of the state. When Kenneth's car was found near the quickback, they knew he was a parolee, and they started creating a case to get him convicted. You hear, got audio okay? What you see is the most bungled investigation. This may be one of the most bungled investigations. Right with prejudice and hatred against Kenneth McDuff. Do you have any doubts that Kenneth McDuff is the man you were looking for? I have no doubt that he's the right man. None at all? Yeah. Huh? Have you seen him? Yes, I have. Looked him in the eye? Yes, I have. What do you see? He looks like maybe your next door neighbor. But he's extremely dangerous toward women and children. And he's just cold blooded. He doesn't show any remorse. All I can do is imagine what he did to her. And I can hear her holler at me all. Help me. And I can see the look on her face for not being so afraid. He hurt my baby. And I want him to hurt. <laughs> Melissa did not live her life. And McDuff got out. He's still living. He should have been dead a long time ago. Still ahead. The witness Macduff's lawyers tried to silence. He gets up there and makes these incredible statements. And it's too many people against me. The first face-to-face -face interview with the man they call the monster. Did you kill Melissa Northrup? No. Did you kill Colleen Reed? No. Today is a turning point in the trial of Kenneth McDuff. Are you going to testify? The jury will hear from a witness the defense had hoped would never take the stand. Are you still scared to testify this morning, Mr. Worley? McDuff's one-time friend, Hank Worley. What do you have to say about the kidnapping of Colleen Reed? Did McDuff do it? Worley has told police that he was with McDuff when McDuff kidnapped and tortured Colleen Reed. Hank, how do you feel about seeing him again? McDuff is on trial for the murder of Melissa Northrup only, but the judge allows Worley to testify about the Colleen Reed case because the crimes are so similar. And proof that he committed one is evidence to be used in the other because they're so identical. Prosecutor John Segrist. Both uh, involved inductions of, of young, white, brunette women abducted from public places at night time. Uh, both involved binding uh, the victim with, sh with shoestring, uh, both involved uh, travel uh, up and down Interstate 35. Cameras are not allowed to record sound of witness testimony, but the jury hears Worley describe in detail how Colleen Reed was kidnapped from the car wash that night and brutalized by Kenneth McDuff. But Worley does not say he saw McDuff kill her. Mr. Worley can get up there and say all these things he wants with impunity because there's simply no way to rebut it. We don't have Colleen Reed's body to rebut it. McDuff's attorney, Mike That's Charlton. I think there's a strong likelihood that Kenneth will be convicted because of that testimony. Are you getting a fair trial here, do you think? Well, they brought this. I wouldn't have had a fair trial up to the point where they brought Worley in. Why is that? He's trying to save himself. and he Worley is. was given limited immunity to testify. Nothing he said here can be used against him later. Is he up for sainthood? Obviously not. But 
there's plenty of reason to believe that he is telling the truth. You don't really tell things like that about yourself if they ain't true. Was he telling the truth on the stand? No. Why would he lie? Look at his statements. He gave six statements. Why would he From lie? prison, McDuff insists that Worley keeps changing his story. And each one of them was uh, completely different. And that Worley was pressured to finger McDuff. Which the authorities got him put my name in his mouth. To say, you know, accuse McDuff, accuse McDuff, you know. And uh, Hank Worley thought he would just accuse me and uh, get out from the situation that he was involved in, if he was involved in it. Why could. wouldn't he have just come out and said, I saw him kill Colleen Reed if this was a setup? Well, it's definitely a setup. Why wouldn't uh, he do it? Why wouldn't he go all the way? I don't know, except that maybe he's trying to keep himself uh, from getting, to be getting the death sentence. During his trial, McDuff decides he is the only one who can tell his story. And so he makes a decision that his lawyers believe could be fatal. In the wake of Worley's testimony, McDuff says he's going to insist that he take the stand. Can you give him a choice? Oh, what have I, I told you? I expect to stand probably today. Oh, you know, your yeah. lawyers don't want you to, Mr. McDuff, are you? Are you still going to do it? Uh, yeah. Even though they strongly say that you shouldn't. Yeah. Why? He wants his story told bluntly, quickly, shortly, and get to the point. But McDuff's testimony is neither short nor to the point. McDuff admits he was near the quick pack the night Melissa Northrup was abducted, but only because his car had broken down. And he says the only reason he fled to Kansas City was to avoid being sent back to prison for using drugs while on parole. Well, it, you know, I, it reminded me back of my young years when Mama used to tell me fairy tales, so it, it uh, brought back fond memories. Fairy tales. Fairy tales. <coughs> for two hours, McDuff tells of his flight from Texas. It's a tale involving drugs and trains and trucks. It is an alibi the prosecutors hope is hard to follow and hard to swallow. Where's the truck driver? Where's the dope dealer that he ran around with? Where's the guy he caught the train with? Where do you think all those people are? They're a figment of your imagination. They're right up here. They weren't right there. In that man's head. But McDuff pays a big price for his time on the stand. Carnell McNamara? Under the rules, his many run-ins with Texas lawmen and his long criminal history... Sheriff Pamplin? ...can now be told. The man should be executed, and that would protect the entire nation against a savage animal. In spite of all that had come in, we thought we were still ready to prove our, our client's innocence. Let me ask you, going into closing argument, how are you feeling about your prospects? Well, I mean, you know, I'd be less than honest if I thought they were real good. How do you think the jury took it? I don't know. What were you trying to convey in your testimony? Well, my attorneys wasn't representing me. I had to get my point across, no matter what, what kind of attack that come under. The only real evidence to indicate I've done anything is my car was at that location. Did you kill Melissa Northrup? No. Did you kill Colleen Reed? No. Did you kill those three teenagers in 1966? No. You've never killed anybody? No. Are you just the most misunderstood man in Texas history? You're being ironic, aren't you? A little bit. <laughs> McDuff has made his case. By now, everyone has an opinion about him. Mr. Thomas, has your jury arrived at a verdict, sir? Yes, we have. If you would but the only out. opinion that matters is the jury's. Mr. McDuff, stand up, please, sir. And the verdict is coming up. The jury having on the 16th day of February... <laughs> Final arguments are scheduled today in the capital murder trial of Kenneth Allen McDuff. For Kenneth Allen McDuff, today is the end of the line. Good morning, Mr. McDuff. Kenneth, what are you going to tell us? What do you think the jury's going to do? do McDuff gonna... entered the courtroom today and took his seat, knowing that the rest of his life lay in the hands of a Harris County jury. That How jury do you think called... people in Texas feel about you? Uh, they think I'm guilty because of the massive news coverage. It, it just started off a, a chain reaction that mushroomed. Kenneth McDuff was likened to everything from the devil. But what is most remarkable about, about it? It's, it's difficult to overcome the tension and I think the fear and even the loathing that I think some people would feel. 
So uh, it's just that's it's going to be a hard one to overcome. If you look at those two crimes, they're almost identical. You can conclude from that evidence that whoever killed Colleen Reed killed Melissa Northrup. I submit to you the evidence shows that this defendant is every person's nightmare, that he's the monster that comes out of the dark and jerks innocent people off the streets and takes them out and slaughters them. I've gotten to argue cases in all courts of the country. I've even argued before the United States Supreme Court. But I have never, in all those years, been confronted with a situation where I was so afraid that the law would mean absolutely nothing. That we would be so willing to abandon that rule of law and give in to hatred and emotion that evidence leads to only one conclusion, that Kenneth Allen McDuff is not guilty. Godspeed. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we're going to let the 13 of you go back to the jury room. Stretch McDuff's fate is now up to the jury and out of the hands of the defense and prosecution attorneys. And for Melissa Northrup's family, a year of waiting for answers is almost over. I'm very glad we've come to this point because today is 11 months that this happened. It's time to put this man back where he belongs. He should have never been let out in the first place. Well, they've been deliberating now about three and a half hours, and of course it's always hard to tell how long they will No longer than 7 o'clock is the feeling around here. If they don't have a verdict by then, they'll be staying overnight until they do. Some jurors... Well, they asked for a bag of clothes. They asked for someone to feed the dog. And we just received word that they may have a verdict within the next hour. Mr. Thomas, has your jury arrived at a verdict, sir? Yes. If you would, please, sir. Hand it to Deputy Robertson. Cause number 643820, the state of Texas versus Kenneth Allen McDuff. We, the jury, find the defendant, Kenneth Allen McDuff, guilty of capital murder, as charged in the indictment. There you go. The jury's verdict is formally received. Mr. McDuff, stand up, please, sir. I assess your punishment at death by lethal injection. Have a seat, please, sir. Justice is done, and this man is going to die. The only thing I hate about it is that we're going to have to wait 10 to 15 years before he does. And that's not right. Melissa didn't get to wait 10 or 15 more years. I'm so sorry about what happened, but I wasn't the one that did it. Do you think the people that let him go should have also been on trial here today? I think they sure should. And what do you think the verdict should have been for them? Guilty. Guilty. Here you are back on death row for the second time. What's going to happen to you? I mean, does this all feel familiar to you? Oh, they're going to kill me is what they're going to do. You seem so calm about that. <laughs> uh... I guess it's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like accepting the inevitable, you know, it's, uh, it's too many people against me, you know, it's just too many. It is almost inconceivable that Kenneth McDuff will get out of this prison alive, but that's what everybody thought the first time. Colin was three years old when he murdered those teenagers that sent him to death row. Amazing that he could get out, be freed, to do it again again and again. Tonight, McDuff remains on death row. There's still no date for his execution by lethal injection. And he may still face other murder charges in the case of Colleen Reed, whose body has never been found. The McDuff case raised new and frightening questions about the entire parole system in Texas. An update on that when we return. We got a caution, aggravated assault, so he does like to fight. Let's do it. Every night, a special team in Houston, Texas, makes house calls. Man, we've got a felony warrant, and we're just going to clear your house. Sit down in that seat right there. This is the Zebra Squad, a unit formed 18 months ago to do what no one else in Texas was doing then. 
tracking down parole violators. There are parole officers that say Kenneth McDuff was a rare case. Doesn't happen. He's not an individual that, quote, slipped through the cracks. He's an individual who was paroled, like many others. He is not an exception. Charlotte Kelly runs the Zebra Squad. In the van, there will be Kelly, Garcia. They Green, dress like Sloan. police, act like police, one, two, and are three, trained four, as police, civilians. with one major right. difference. Is anyone in this room getting paid for what they're doing tonight? No, ma'am. Not monetarily. These are all volunteers who work all day at other jobs and then come in at night to suit up with the zebras. What do you do? I work for the Houston Fire Department and also patrol here part time. Private investigator, work for several law firms. And a safety director for a trucking company. I work uh, for an international oil company. Why are you willing to do this without any kind of pay? We're doing it because we want to and because we're dedicated and we, we're trying to make a difference. I have two children, a mother, a grandmother. They're all potential victims of this crime that's going on. But isn't there something wrong with the system that people have to volunteer to do this? I think so. You know, until we begin this program. They knew that they were not being sought, and if they didn't get caught doing something else, that they were pretty well safe. Who are you looking for tonight? Okay, this subject is Johnny Ray Lee. This subject right here received 45 years in Navarro County for five counts of aggravated sexual assault. Pedro Gonzalez, his fourth arrest is now pending since we now have a warrant for his uh, arrest on his parole violation. Ruben Palacios, and this is the fourth time a warrant has been issued for this subject for being in violation of his parole. Do you think this man is a dangerous this man? This man is armed and dangerous. There are 6,000 of these fugitives, or absconders as they're called, hidden somewhere out there in the Houston area. 26,000 throughout the state of Texas. They are all felons, many of them dangerous felons. And they're on the loose, not because of some jailbreak. They simply walked away from their parole officers. Spend a day with a Texas parole officer, and it's easy to see how that can happen. Hi. How are you? Usually she's not home, you know, for uh, her home visit. Even though she knows you're coming? Even though she knows I'm coming, for the most part. Parole officer Teresa Hackney has more than 80 cases like this. Well, when you came to the office, you didn't tell me that you had another resident. When I came up the other day, I told you. 80 parolees yeah, she's supposed to see at least once every month. That is, if they're even home when she comes calling. He knows you're coming? Yeah. I told him I was. This is pretty normal, though? Does this yeah. happen a lot? Yeah, it does. That means I'll have to come back out again. You don't look very happy about that. <laughs> it's a long ride. Do you feel you adequately protect the public? Not adequately, no, because you never know what one will go out and do. We had an officer who was... Uh slammed against the wall of a house uh, the other day. So whenever you're out there, remember who you're dealing with and where you're at. B.C. Tarvin is a parole officer supervisor. That. Let's be honest, there's some people missing from your own roles, right? There's some people you there's don't know probably, There's probably uh, uh, 25 people on everybody's caseload who are abscounders. That's at, and they still have 80 cases to supervise. And how do you know those people aren't committing crimes right now? Well, we really don't. See your hands, man. See your hands. Open the door. With any luck, the volunteer zebras will pick them up first. Where's your ID? You don't have On this evening, the squad found a missing parolee, the convicted rapist Reuben Palacios, just sitting in a car in front of his mother's house. If you hadn't come tonight, would there have been anyone else out looking for him? None that I know of. Why isn't there anyone out looking for him? The only group out looking for him was a volunteer squad. I think it's money. Texas Governor Ann Richards. At a time when the populace says, don't raise my taxes, they also said, be sure that there are plenty of people doing the jobs. And of course, people and money are the same thing. Just last month, to try to avoid another McDuff case, Governor Richards formed her own fugitive squad. But because of prison overcrowding, the state is still forced to release 70 parolees every day. You're confident that every one of those 70 people who are being let out every single day are ready for parole? We are as confident as we can be when you are dealing with a criminal population.
So how do you protect society when you can't pull these people in whenever they violate parole? You protect society in the same way you protect your own families. You do everything that you can do for them. And you pray to God that it works. Many in Texas agree that outrage over the McDuff case has shed light on serious problems in the parole system and could help bring about change. Some say it couldn't happen a moment too soon. In addition to McDuff, 67 death row inmates in Texas were freed on parole. And tonight, no one knows where two of them are. I'm Dan Rather, and that's 48 Hours.